It has been described as the modern day Handmaid's Tale, a female led Lord of the Flies and a feminist horror novel. I find it all of these things and none of these things at the same time. What I really see is a powerful allegory that serves as a chilling criticism of our society. What made this book even more powerful was to learn that it was inspired by an actual place, the Hay Institution for Girls that was open from 1961 to 1974 in Hay, New South Wales, Australia. Today we are talking about The Natural Way of Things by Australian author Charlotte Wood. Taken from their lives, 10 girls wake up in a hazy drug state unsure where they are or why. Two men and a woman are their keepers. Their modern clothes are taken in exchange for old-fashioned tunics and work boots. Their hair is shaved. They are chained together to hike through the wilderness to see what exactly will happen to them if they attempt to escape. They're trying to figure out what is happening and why. As time goes on, they begin to vaguely recognize one another and what they all have in common. Told from the point of view of two women, Yolanda and Verla, the natural way of things details their battle to survive and resist in an environment where their individuality has been stripped, their identity reconstructed, choice has been stolen, and they are forced to confront uncomfortable truths about themselves and each other. This is one of the most powerful books I have read this year. I finished it three weeks ago, reread it, and I'm still thinking about it. Break it down! There is so much to break down in this novel. I wasn't exactly sure how I was going to proceed with it. So I decided that I would start where the novel opened, then move on to the discovery of why they're imprisoned, the shift of power, and a character breakdown. And then within those categories, some of the more subtle things I noticed about this book. So there were Cuckoo Burrows here. This was the first thing Yolanda knew in the dark morning. This is the first line of the natural way of things, and it foreshadows the importance of the environment and nature to this entire story. The women wake up in individual rooms which turn out to be sheep pens, and their prison is actually an abandoned sheep station. Verla and Yolanda first meet one another after they wake up from their abduction and have been led into a room. Unsure and apprehensive of each other, when one of the male jailers come in, they reach for one another's hand. They are asked who is going first and Yolanda volunteers. This is where their bond really begins. Verla sees this as Yolanda being stronger than her. Yolanda thinks it's better to volunteer and know what's going to happen than be stuck in a room wondering what's going to happen. This is where we first really see the contrast into who Verla and Yolanda are as people. After Yolanda has been gone for a bit, the male jailer comes back for Verla. Finally, some instinct rises. She runs her tongue over her teeth, furred like her mind. She hears her own thick voice deep inside her ears when she says, I need to know where I am. The man stands there tall and narrow, hands still on the doorknob, surprised. He says, almost in sympathy, Oh, sweetie, you need to know what you are. After the girls all have their heads shaved, they are chained together and forced to go on a hike in the rugged terrain. Once they return, they are marched into a large room in a house where they will eat. Verla looks around the table then. Despite the shaved skulls, one by one the girls' faces clarify for an instant and then merge, and Verla knows that she and they are in some dreadful way connected. Bonser's words return. In the days to come, she will learn what she is, what they all are, that they are the minister's little travel tramp and that Skype slut and that yucky ugly dog from the cruise ship. They are pig on a spit and big red box, mole number 12 and the bogan gold digging gangbang slut. They are what happens when you don't keep your fucking fat slag mouth shut. These 10 young women, kidnapped and now held captive, were all involved in some sort of public set scandal. Verla sees herself as different though. She wasn't used, abused, and discarded. The politician she was involved with, yeah, he really loved her. While the format of the book is told in three parts, summer, autumn, and winter, I feel the book really has two parts. Part one is exploring the kidnapping of the women and breaking them down using forced labor, malnutrition, and violence to control them. Teddy and Bonser are clearly in charge of them. The women are at their weakest here physically and emotionally. Part two comes when the company that is in charge of Teddy and Bonser, Harding International, stops communicating with them. Electricity gets turned off, Supplies and food stop arriving. The jailers lose some of their power when they discovered that while they were focused on preventing these girls from discovering a way out, 
Someone else is also making sure the jailers are kept in. When the camp loses electricity, they run to the electric fence to discover that it is ran by a completely different power source they didn't know about. This is where we see a shift in behavior and a shift in power. I think that this is a statement on how oppression can also work against those who try to maintain it. And I think that it was done in such a very intelligent and subtle way. This is also the point where I've seen a lot of criticism of this book. The power has shifted. There are 10 girls and three guards. Why didn't the girls just overpower them? Up until this point, the girls were intentionally kept weak. They had been drugged. They had their identity stripped from them. They were forced into hard labor in the hot sun during the day. In the evenings, they were fed what could be reduced to slop. They were dehydrated. They had been emotionally beaten down too. Not just in prison, but before arriving in the court of public opinion, social media, news, articles, blogs. Once the shift happened, Bouncer became more unhinged because the motivation that kept his behavior in line, the pay from Harding International, was no longer there. But here's the thing. I do think the women reclaimed some of the power here, except it's within the framework of what their environment allowed. They started talking more. They each found roles to play in this new culture they were living in, hunter, gatherer, cook, sister. They changed the locks on their doors so instead of being locked in from the outside, they could lock the outside out now. Don't forget, they have no electricity, they have no telephones, they have no computers, there is no television. There is a huge electric fence encircling the property that runs on a different power source, and they were given a pretty gruesome demonstration of the power of that fence. There are three characters I want to discuss in a little more detail. The guards, Bouncer, Teddy, and Nancy. Bouncer sounding so similar to Bouncer is not a mistake. A Bouncer's job is to keep order, protect his or her workplace, or use violence if necessary. Bouncer sees this as the epitome of his identity. It is also no mistake that he is more aggressive of the two male guards. He constantly accuses Teddy of being gay. Bouncer constantly strokes the stick he beats the girls with. He's never had a girlfriend. Again, not a mistake. He has a hatred of these women, yet he craves them sexually. In today's terms, Bouncer is the incel, pissed off at the world, and wouldn't you know it, it's all a woman's fault. His misogyny is clear, and it is something he has embraced as a part of his belief system, and it rules his behavior. Teddy is the opposite of Bouncer. He's young, he's good looking, he practices yoga every day. At the beginning, when Bouncer talks about which girl they would have sex with, Teddy reminds him that they're here to do a job, and Harding International would not like that. There are moments when he shows sympathy for the girls, but quickly finds his resolve when Bouncer's around. He leaves the punishment to Bouncer. He is only there to get the money he needs to continue his travel. He doesn't appear to be a threat, but then we hear him talk about his ex-girlfriend. He blames her for everything. And we see the way he uses Nancy. We learn that while he's not as aggressive and blunt about his feelings for women, Teddy too lives by the rules of misogyny. In today's terms, he would be the guy that's kind, caring, and an ally until it comes to confronting his own behavior. The contrast of these two characters brilliantly demonstrates the complex ways in which misogyny is steeped into attitudes towards women in our society. And lastly, that brings us to Nancy. Nancy is a young woman with her own questionable background. Though she has absolutely no medical experience at all, she's hired to attend to the women's health care. We first meet her when one of the girls is taken to get medical attention and Nancy greets them dressed in a plain nurse's outfit. Nancy tries desperately to get Bouncer's attention. When Bouncer rejects her, she moves right along to get Teddy. She has no empathy or sympathy for the women in prison. None. At all. Yet it is these women, not Bouncer and not Teddy, that tend to her once her fate has been assigned. I believe the inclusion of Nancy is meant to demonstrate what happens to those women that willingly participate in misogyny rather than fight against it. So for some final thoughts, I have read this book twice now and I could probably read it five more times and still pick up something new. This book is a stunning piece of literature and I highly, highly, highly recommend it, even if this isn't the usual genre that you read. If you'd like to learn more about the Hay Institution for Girls, I have a few links down in the description of this video. Be prepared though. The rabbit hole I went down left me horrified and in utter disbelief. Things like that aren't supposed to happen, and they do. I know that time is a precious commodity and I appreciate you gifting me your time today. If you'd like to follow me on social media, you can follow me on Goodreads, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, all at the username Amy Gets Lit. Until next time, 
I hope you take some time this week to find something that brings you joy. Thank you for watching.